Good, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon and welcome to this side event at Arctic Frontiers. My name is uh, Hans Christian Hernes. I'm a professor in political science at UIT, the Arctic University of Norway. And I'm also a member of the steering committee for the Moon Prize. And uh, as many of you know, uh, the winner of the Moon Prize 2024 uh, is Oren Young, who got uh, good words and a diploma today, earlier today. This uh, side event is one of the two seminars that uh, the steering committee organized to honor the winner, to highlight his research then, but also to contribute to the public debate over important Arctic issues. Tomorrow morning, uh, there will be a seminar at the UIT campus in Breivika where we can learn more about Oren's research and learn more about institu institutions and challenges for future Arctic research. I'm very glad that we can have the opportunity today to discuss the situation for and future role of, of the Arctic Council. It was established in 1996 and has gradually become the key institution in Arctic governance and cooperation. Uh, it was in important in, the raising, uh, in raising the, the questions about uh, consequences on climate. It had a role in initiating the work on shipping, which ended with the Polar Code. And the Council has generally been important in developing and dissemination, dissemination of knowledge on the environment and the interface between humans and uh, nature, to just to mention very few things. The way the Council was organized and working, including the indigenous peoples uh, at the table, did also contribute to making it an example of innovative institutions, institution building in the Arctic that Oren has told us a, a lot about. Um, and yeah, he will probably continue to tell us about the Arctic exceptionalism. But today, uh, we know that the Council is struggling. The Arctic 8 has become Arctic 7 uh, in reality, with the largest country, Russia, standing at, at the outside. We have a very fine panel, uh, and the knowledge in the panel makes it possible to eliminate uh, several aspects of the current challenges and possible futures or future pathways. So I'm looking forward uh, to the pre presentation and discussion here. Um, I've tried to organize it uh, and uh, will do it in the following way. Oren Young uh, will give a short keynote, about 15 minutes. Then it's Mark Lantain from UIT. Solveig Rosseb Rossebe, a senior Arctic official uh, from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Norway. Uh, it's Svein Vigeland Rottem from Fritjof Nansen Institute, and it's Gorsia Smisek Rice from UIT that ends the, the presentation. They will have about five to seven minutes, and I will also give the panel a possibility or an opportunity to comment on uh, what has been said from other members of the panel. So questions uh, and comments they might have, have to, to themselves. Then we open up for comments and questions from the audience. So we have tried to organize this so that we have a microphone f that we can, can send around and have um, questions and, and then comments from, from you that, that, that's here in the room. I hope we can have an, I wouldn't say enjoyable, but an stimulating uh, afternoon here. Uh, I'm impressed that we have so many in the audience. So then, uh, Oren, the floor is yours, and uh, congratulations with the prize. And I know that you will stimulate the audience to think and, and comment. Thank you. Thank you, Hans Christian. It's been a busy day, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm still standing. <laughs> um, 
I'd like, to, I'd like to make three sets of comments in relationship to the topic of this session. Uh, the first set of comments has to do with a changing political context. The second set of, context, uh, of comments has to do with the implications of the changing political context for the Arctic Council itself. And the third set of comments has to do with the linkages or the relationships, shall we say, between the Arctic Council and the sort of broader tapestry of Arctic governance arrangements. So uh, coming back then to the first one. So institutions always operate within a setting shaped by the prevailing political context. And when the political context changes, especially when it changes fundamentally, institutions have to either adapt or become dead letters. The institutions usually don't die, but they can easily become kind of sidelined uh, and dead letters. And in the case of the Arctic, the uh, political context today is fundamentally different from the political context in the 1990s at the time when the Arctic Council was created. Then the Cold War was winding down. We were looking for opportunities to initiate collaboration or cooperation between Russia and the West. And the Arctic seemed like a attractive uh, opportunity to pursue that goal. There weren't any deeply rooted conflicts in the Arctic itself. And at the same time, the Arctic was kind of a remote region. So most of the rest of the world at that time was willing to let the Arctic countries initiate things like the Arctic Council without paying too much attention. So that was then. Think about the situation now. The situation now is that in the Arctic itself, we have deepening hostility between Russia and the Western countries. This is not just a matter of the Ukraine war starting in 2022. It certainly can be traced back to the first Ukraine crisis and maybe even a bit before. So instead of looking for opportunities to cooperate in a post-Cold War environment, we're looking at a situation of, can we nevertheless find common ground despite deepening conflict? But at the same time, the, the linkages, the Arctic has become much more tightly coupled to the global system. Partly, this is a matter of economics and commercial activities, but overwhelmingly, it's a, it's a matter of climate change. Uh, we know that the Arctic is average temperatures are increasing at three or four times the global average. But there are also very powerful feedback mechanisms affecting the global climate system. And so uh, the Arctic is very much a very central and fundamental component of the global climate system. As a result, almost everyone is interested in the Arctic now. The whole world is interested in the Arctic. It's, uh, who knew? <laughs> Back in the 1980s and 1990s when we started to talk about the age of the Arctic, uh, who knew? But now everybody's interested in the Arctic. And so the political context is fundamentally different than it was um, back in the 1980s and 1990s. And so if you go back to my first comment, institutions operate within a larger setting determined by the political context, you have to then ask, well, uh, what does this mean for the Arctic Council? And this brings me to, to my second uh, set of comments. The basic story or the basic message is <coughs> there is no way to turn the clock back. Whatever happens, whatever the outcome of the Ukraine crisis, we can't go back to business as usual. 
with respect to the operation of the Arctic Council. Uh, I, I regard myself as, a, as an optimistic realist. <laughs> uh, and so uh, I don't have any illusions about the um, prospects and where it is that we're likely to be able to go with respect to the Arctic Council. Nevertheless, um, it's still the case that there aren't any intractable conflicts rooted in the Arctic itself. The Arctic is actually a, ra a rather peaceful region of the world. It's still the case that there are a fairly wide range of issues which would benefit from cooperative initiatives in the Arctic. And it's still the case that there's a rather large community of people who care, who would really like to see constructive things happen with respect to Arctic issues. So for those reasons, I don't think the situation is, is hopeless. But what could we realistically expect the Arctic Council to do? My answer to that question is, the Arctic Council can do potentially a variety of fairly informal, low-key kinds of activities. The Arctic Council has never had the authority to make major policy decisions or the resources to implement major policy decisions. But there are other roles, and these roles are by no means trivial. There is the role of, of early warning, identifying emerging issues and, and framing them for consideration in policy arenas. This is a, what political scientists call uh, agenda formation, a very important but often under uh, acknowledged stage in the policy process. We often say, if, if you allow me to set the agenda, I'll let you, t I'll let you make the decisions. <laughs> so it's a matter of early warning, identifying issues and helping to think about how they could be formulated or framed. There's also uh, questions of monitoring and assessment. And I think we know from the history of the Arctic Council that one of its more striking successes has been in the realm of monitoring and assessment. I think it's amazing. When we did the first State of the Arctic Environment Report that came out in 1997, initiated under the Arctic Environmental Protection Strategy, the predecessor of the Arctic Council, uh, I was very skeptical at the beginning whether this initiative, whether this project would come to anything. And the State of the Arctic Environment Report turned out to be it wasn't a policy, it wasn't a decision, a very influential product, a uh, testimony to the work of some people like <coughs> Lars Otto Ryerson. Um, but that's another thing, monitoring and assessment. And, and the third thing, uh, which I think is significant at this kind of informal, kind of low-key level, is what I call exercising convening power. That's to say the ability to bring together a very large collection of people uh, representing diverse interests and diverse players in the um, Arctic world to be able, in a fairly informal setting, to be able to talk to each other, to engage in dialogue, to begin to think about whether we might be able to make progress. This is not a matter of resolving conflicts. We have our conflicts. They're not going to go away. But just because we have our conflicts doesn't mean that we can't find common ground on some issues of significance. And the convening power, this is not like a conference of the parties of a treaty or a convention. It's a much more informal opportunity where we're not actually negotiating text and feeling that we have to follow the orders coming down from our foreign ministry. It's where we can still sit around over coffee and say, 
you know, could we find some creative, innovative ways to make progress on at least some uh, issues? And that means, I think, in terms of the prospects for the Arctic Council, that we should be minimizing our concern, minimizing our focus on issues of membership, uh, formal rules of procedure, and I'll be provocative here and say we should be actually minimizing the roles of foreign ministries <laughs> and relying to a large extent on the work of the working groups and the, the nitty gritty, and what, what the real substance over the last 25 years uh, of the Arctic Council. That's where the creative initiatives have really emerged. Uh, and that's where I think they might emerge going forward. But even that isn't going to be easy. I mean, we know. I mean, the Norwegian chairship has been working very hard to get things restarted at the working group level. I know from talking to different working groups, it's, it's not an easy thing to do in these times. And so here I think, um, at the end of the day, a great deal depends upon um, human relations. It comes down to people. And people who develop, over time, relationships of confidence and trust and who are able, regardless of what the label they wear on their tag is, uh, who know each other and can talk to each other and can say, yeah, let's, let's kick around some ideas as to what, what might work, where, the, where, there's some, where there's some window of opportunity, where we can see some light, and maybe come up with some innovative and different approaches which are not standard operating procedures in the realm of negotiating international treaties and conventions, but which might work in a more informal setting like the Arctic Council. So I think that the, the human dimension, the reliance on people, and you know, those of us who are members of the Arctic community and develop these relationships over long periods of time, we still talk to our Russian colleagues we still interact with people. It is possible. So I, I say I'm an optimistic realist. I don't want to say it's going to be easy, and we may end up with a lot of roadblocks, but I still have a sense of optimism. And then my third set of comments about the, um, the broader tapestry. When it comes to Arctic governance, the Arctic Council is not the only game in town. There's a lot of Arctic governance which occurs in other settings. Now, it's very interesting to talk about the relationships between the Arctic Council, where the Arctic Council fits into this larger tapestry. You know, I, I think I was saying in some other session here in the last two days, there are some cases where you have different international institutions and there's a division of, of labor you take care of fishing, you take care of um, shipping, you take care of marine mammals. But there are other situations where there's, where there's a division of roles and where if it's a matter of shipping, uh, you may have monitoring and assessment taking place in the Arctic Council. But when it comes to regulatory decisions, you turn to the international maritime organization. So I think we need to think about how to weave the Arctic Council into this tapestry of Arctic governance. So there's, there's a lot of Arctic governance going on in other venues, other forums, other settings. Um, some of it's uh, specialized agencies like the International Maritime Organization. Some of it's standalone treaties like the Central Arctic Ocean Fisheries Agreement, which, by the way, is alive and well. There are actually meetings, of, don't, don't say there's there too many journalists present, but there are meetings of the parties, conferences of the parties taking place under the terms of the Central Arctic Ocean Fisheries Agreement. 
governance is actually happening. And so my best hope in terms of the uh, future of the Arctic Towns, what's our title under, in times of geopolitical uncertainty, my best hope is that uh, it flying beneath the radar, the Arctic Council can't necessarily resolve issues, but can be a link in a chain, can be a cog in the wheel where it can do things which may not get a lot of the headlines and a lot of the glory and the attention, but actually feed in to some of these other governance processes in ways that make it possible for some of these other governance processes to do things which actually do make a difference, which they would not have been able to do if they didn't have the input coming from the Arctic Council. So this is a modest perspective, I think. I mean, I don't, it was, there was a time when people said, we should upgrade the Arctic Council, make it into a fully fledged intergovernmental organization, link it hopefully with an Arctic, a pan-Arctic treaty. That's not in the cards. <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, that's perfectly fine. <laughs> but in this much more modest but still important um, perspective, I think there could be room to run for the Arctic Council, even in these times, to do things which in the long sweep of time, when we look back over time, we say, that was a really useful thing to do. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Oren. You have given us a lot of food for thought. Um, our next speaker is uh, Mark Lantain. He is an associate professor in political science at UIT. He is also the coordinator of a geopolitical network at UIT and uh, are uh, part of the larger geopolitical project that's just started here in, in Norway. So please, Mark. Is this on? Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. And Professor Young, all I have to say is uh, this gives new dimension to the term hard act to follow. <laughs> so I will do my best. Um, I want to pick up on one of the points you made. I'd love to pick up on many, but keeping an eye on the time. Everybody's talking about the Arctic. Uh, I completely agree, for starters. And what I'd like to do for my presentation is talk about the everybody in regards to countries outside of the Arctic, the observers of the Arctic Council, the country observers specifically. Because this has been an issue which has been a point of discussion, and if anything, it has become much more distinct as a result of a lot of conversations about one major non-Arctic state, China, and I will get back to that in a moment. Last weekend, I had the privilege of helping out with a climate change project featuring uh, graduate students from all around the Arctic learning about climate change. So they were here in Tromsø, and they're going to be also experiencing uh, these issues in Greenland and in Iceland. And I had the challenging um, job of trying to explain Arctic security in a very short time to these students. So I talked about two of the major areas of Arctic security. We can discuss the environment, we can discuss human security, and also the big debate about um, whether or not uh, great power politics or military politics has returned to the Arctic, but that's another section. What I also talked about, though, is something which in business slang is referred to as a gray rhino. So we probably heard about a black swan event, something which is unprecedented, but there's another creature called a gray rhino, and that is something which is in the corner. It's very visible. We can all see it, but nothing is done about it until it becomes an even bigger issue. 
And the argument I'd like to make is that the question of the internationalization of the Arctic and how it's affecting the Arctic Council, I think, is a pretty distinct gray rhino. So there have been 13 government observers uh, within the Arctic Council. And I've had the opportunity to study the Arctic identity building of some of them, not only China, but also other major observers such as uh, Japan, uh, more recently Switzerland, and potentials such as Estonia and Latvia. And I found that when we talk about non-Arctic countries wanting to engage the Arctic Council, they tend to fall into almost three categories, although there's quite a bit of overlap between them. The first I would call the legacy observers, those that have a very long, robust history of scientific cooperation and engagement in the Arctic. So I could talk about France, the UK, Germany, Poland, Netherlands, those that have a great deal of scientific credentials. A second category has emerged more recently, I would say just over the past 10 years, and for want of a better term, I would call them the all-arounds. Those that certainly do have a great deal of scientific credentials, but have also tried to develop a more economic and in some cases educational aspect. So I would add to that group China, Japan, Korea, India, and that very unsung Arctic state of Singapore. <laughs> You also have, and again, there's no kind of, there's quite a bit of overlap between these three, those that consider themselves Arctic adjacent. Those that are, well, we're not quite the Arctic, but if you look at a map, we are very close. And we certainly do have um, Arctic, an Arctic say because of our geography. I remember, I think it was 2014, uh, where you had a paper come out from Great Britain. They referred to themselves as the Arctic's closest neighbor. And I got some very interesting email from some of my Chinese colleagues saying, well, how come we can call ourselves uh, near Arctic state and that's a problem, but UK can do it? This is all very confusing. <laughs> so trying to address the question, though, of non-Arctic uh, states in the Arctic, the reason why I say that this should be considered a gray rhino is that we are seeing, as Professor Young just noted, people are interested in the Arctic. And this interest in many cases has manifested itself as a desire to become more engaged. Now, you don't have observers coming out and saying, well, I don't think the Arctic Council is uh, doing what I want it to do. We want something different. We're not really seeing that right now. But we are seeing, in some cases, uh, countries trying to say, well, is there, are there other ways that we can manifest our interest? Can we contribute? in areas of Arctic governance that are starting to appear. And as was noted, the Arctic Council is not the only game in town. There have been agreements. I could talk about the Polar Code. I could talk about the Central Arctic Fishing Ban, various other areas of Track 2 cooperation, where areas are starting to open up for greater participation by non-Arctic states. My question, though, is will that be enough in the future? We all know that the Arctic Council now is running into some difficulties, and this has definitely caused a bit of a stir among the observer governments who are wondering, how is this going to affect our ability to engage the Arctic states? How is this going to affect our ability to have a say in where things are going in terms of Arctic governance? And there's no clear answer here. There have been some very high level track two conferences just over the past year or so. Uh, including in Japan, one coming up in Germany, more than one. And I had the pleasure of um, participating in an Arctic Circle forum in another unsung Arctic state, the United Arab Emirates. So even though we can talk about the observers now, we have other countries that are starting to appear also stepping up and saying, yes, I would like more of a say. Now, just to talk very briefly about China, because I see the green clock in front of me. Um, <laughs> China has been especially um, questioning the idea of, well, can we continue to be an observer in the Arctic Council when our interests in the Arctic are growing quite a bit? And one question which I want to ask is, maybe things are fine now, but let's extrapolate 10 years or 15 years. Will China be happy still being an observer? That's what observers do, they observe, especially as China continues to develop a presence there. 
And one other point that's very key, there's been a lot of discussion about other organizations that have been kind of spearheaded by Russia. I'm talking specifically about the BRICS, now known as the BRICS Plus, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. So the hints are starting to appear, especially now that we're concerned about maybe the Arctic starting to split into different, one of my colleagues called it uh, political constellations how the Arctic Council will be able to address this, especially under very complicated situations. So I guess the statement that I'm going to uh, leave you with is please keep an eye on the gray rhino and hopefully we'll be able to understand it a bit better. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Mark. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Solveig Rotsebø. She is the senior Arctic official, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Norway. And I'm not, I'm not sure if you are the boss for the issues that we are discussing, but, but you are a, a, a central uh, person in, in the work that Norway is doing as the chair of the Arctic Council at the moment. So please. My boss, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. My boss talked yesterday <laughs> on the scene. <laughs> Thank you for two very inspiring and provocative introductions. Uh, since I am uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, I'm supposed to hold the, the boring and bureaucratic introduction. <laughs> so I will tr try not to, <laughs> not to do something else. Uh, I will start to congratulate Mr. Young with the Moon, Pr Moon Prize. I'm honored to be in the same room as you. <laughs> um, uh, membership in the Arctic Council is decided not by achievement, but by geography. We are not A7. We're still not A7. We are A8. We are the eight Arctic countries. And we are, the eight country, countries are the Arctic. So it's not so that um, I would not go to the Mediterranean and, <laughs> and demand to be a part of the Mediterranean cooperation because I don't belong to the Mediterranean, but I am the Arctic. Um, but of course, as Mr. Young said, the context has changed. It is challenging with one of the members having invaded his, its neighboring country. Um, but still, as, Nor as seen from Norway, the Arctic Council is special. It has over the years developed into a unique platform for cooperation between the eight Arctic states and, this, uh, and the indigenous peoples in the region. And we think this is very special. And we see this as a platform for cooperation between the people, the countries in the region. Uh, the indigenous peoples uh, are distributed differently than the states uh, across the borders, like for example, the Sami people distributed to over four countries, Norway, Sweden, Finland, Russia, Inuit people, same, also four countries. Denmark, Greenland, uh, uh, Canada, Alaska, uh, US, and um, Russia, actually. And as we all know, a lot of important work is going on within the Arctic Council. There is knowledge production, delivering data to important global processes on climate change, on environment, there is going on cooperation between local, regional, and state level. There is um, uh, going on emergency preparedness, search and rescue. We use traditional knowledge from the indigenous peoples in, for example, fighting wildland fires. The Arctic Council is alive and it continues to develop. As my foreign minister said yesterday, the purpose of the Arctic Council is to keep the Arctic perspective. And we believe that it is crucial that we who live in the Arctic take the major responsibility for addressing challenges and ensuring a vibrant and sustainable Arctic. Arctic is special when it comes to climate change. Uh, it has been said a thousand times during this conference, is warming up four times faster than the rest of the world. Uh, my prime minister said this morning, the Arctic is a window to the future. So we need multilateral cooperation to tackle climate change and its consequences. 
and not only from the eight countries, of course, uh, research, but uh, research on effects of climate change in the Arctic is particularly important, and to get the full picture, we need circumpolar data, data from the whole region, not only from half the region. Uh, the Norwegian perspective on the Arctic is long term. The choices we take today will have consequences for the future cooperation in the Arctic. We have lost two northern international organizations, the Barents Corporation, the CBSS, uh, at least lost them in the form that they were. If we lose the Arctic Council now, it might be difficult to re-establish it and we value the cooperation in the Council too much to risk losing it. The Norwegian chairship priorities are oceans, climate and environment, sustainable economic development, and last but not least, people in the North, with the cross-cutting themes, uh, indigenous peoples and youth. Since we took over the chair, we have been working, as has been said, to resume much of the work that was put on pause after Russia's invasion of Ukraine. This has been challenging, difficult. We're still not uh, reached our goals. And of course, we all understand that the cooperation cannot be as it used to be in today's international situation. We have to agree on a compromise, maybe a lower pace, but Still, um, we are working to increase the activity. We need the a Arctic Council to be relevant, and then it has to continue to deliver results. So we are working to find the right balance, finding functioning working modalities acceptable for all the eight members. The primary goal for the Norwegian chairship is to ensure that the Arctic Council as a whole with all its eight member states, remains the most important multilateral forum for Arctic cooperation. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Svein Vigeland Rottem. He is a senior researcher at the Fritjof Nansen Institute. And uh, yeah. You are an expert on the Arctic Council, so please. Hopefully, hopefully. Thank you, and congratulations, Oren. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and I'm proud to be part of the same panel as you. So I've been reading your stuff since I was like this. So, so this is really, really good. <laughs> um, mm, the starting point for our discussion is that, as you all know, in the beginning of March 2022, the work of the Arctic Council was temporarily paused by the seven Western Arctic states because of the war in Ukraine. And uh, not surprisingly, this was one of the most severe blows to Arctic operation in decades. Uh, and as you know, the pause applies uh, or applied to all official co council meetings as well as in its, in its sub bodies. However, as Solveig said, some work has started up in the working groups and decisions may be adopted by written procedure. So it, easy, it is easy to argue uh, that the survival of the Arctic Council is in danger. <coughs> However, the Arctic Council is still functioning, partly. And the question is really, how and why the Arctic Council has survived till now, and why it is important that the Arctic Council is still functioning. Clearly, my presentation has a lot of overlap with <laughs> earlier presentations, but I will draw and highlight like three key points messages, uh, messages here. Uh, firstly, when the Arctic Council was established in 1996, indigenous groups were given the status as permanent participants. These representatives uh, lack decision-making uh, powers, but sit at the table with the other members, taking part in discussions when decisions are to be taken. Moreover, they are heard, a unique situation in international cooperation. And if the Arctic Council fails to survive, this unique construction will unravel, and that will be a huge setback for the Arctic indigenous groups. 
their possibilities of influ influencing and being heard in discussions concerning the future of the Arctic homeland could disappear. And this insight can also partly explain why the Arctic Council is still functioning. Secondly, and as many of you have already said, the Arctic Council with its various working groups is a unique producer of valuable knowledge. Over the course of three decades now, researchers and members of the civil services in the Arctic countries have established networks and gathered information that has informed uh, international convention work and underpin national level administration. Because what we all know, without solid knowledge, it is impossible to take well-founded decisions for tackling climate and environmental challenges in the Arctic, but also globally. If the Arctic Council fails to survive the crisis, the web of carefully built up networks will or might collapse and cannot be rebuilt overnight. And I heard some say that, well, we can rebuild it in another fashion. But I would say, if you have this view, one cannot realize how long it takes for an institution to be build up credibility and power necessary for it to be heard. And this importance of the work of the Arctic Council is acknowledged among most Arctic states. Thirdly, and this is like the broad, broad uh, view on it, all Arctic states highlight the Arctic Council as the main arena for international cooperation in the Arctic. There are several reasons for this. Firstly, one could argue, but fostering multilateral cooperation, uh, multilateral cooperation mechanisms Arctic states can contract potential expansionist aspiration that non-Arctic states have in the region. And showing well-functioning cooperation in the Arctic also defeats the potential emergence of a conflict-driven narrative, as we have seen for two decades now. And further, uh, this commitment aligns strategically uh, with the interests of the coastal states particularly in reinforcing the legitimacy of the Law of the Sea Convention. The Council directly and indirectly safeguards exclusive rights for these states concerning national resources. One example is that recognizing coastal state rights is a prerequisite for attaining observer status in the Council. So one could argue from a strategic perspective that the cooperation's overall structure holds more significance than the specifics of its content. Of course, there are a lot of other reasons why the Arctic Council is still functioning, and Norway has done a great job, uh, especially the mem uh, Morten and Yusol way, so great, great work. But these three might be the ones most important. And the question now, is whether the Arctic Council will survive this crisis. And the second question is, is it politically and morally possible to cooperate with Russia? I would end my short presentation by saying that there are, much, there are more questions than there are answers. Looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. So, we have the last <coughs> speaker. Uh, it's uh, Gosia Smisek Rice, working as a postdoc and researcher at UIT. So I'll just leave the mic microphone for you and welcome. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I've already said it several times, it's not my usual voice, uh, but I hope it's going to carry me for the next few minutes. Um, another thing, opening, I have Spain and Jen as witnesses to um, that as Oren was speaking, I was actually um, crossing out things from my list of points that I was hoping to make here. Um, so the list that I have with me here now was just drafted. Um, so yes, so that, that has been interesting. I was actually entirely expecting this before this discussion, um, but I was hoping that four speakers will cover that. Oren covered it all. Thank you. Um, it has been absolutely uh, no different during my PhD time when Oren was my supervisor um, and always just pushing me forward. So let's see if I can raise to, to that point today. 
Um, that being said, in, in the introduction, and when Hans Christian invited us to this discussion, I was um, asked to reflect on a few aspects related to science policy in the Arctic Council, which of course goes very much to the core of, of the work of the Council. Um, and I thought that, that, that the, perhaps one point that I wanted to make here is actually um, that I think that, especially today, um, it is useful to think about the Arctic Council as something that is not static, but actually something that is um, always in, in the making. Um, and with this, I wanted to, Oren, uh, as Oren said in his, um, in his opening remarks, that it's the political context that is really the wide setting that kind of defines how institutions operate in the given time. And actually one of the things that um, really set up the Arctic Council the way it, it functioned for the first almost, for the first decade, for the first 10 years in, in operation, and sorry, I, I need to tell you, the clock didn't even start going down, so I still have seven minutes. <laughs> <laughs> And I've already went through half of my list, so um, I will probably never be closer to stand-up comedy than at this point. So I, I appreciate the laughs, really. Oh, perfect! Now it's three fifty. Um, let's let's go through that. Um, my my point here. Um, is, is really that, even though, of course, ministries of foreign affairs of Arctic states were closely involved in establishment of the Arctic Council and set up the framework for, for the Council, the truth is that the working groups were given a lot of leeway during this first 10 years in operation. And I think there is a lot to say about how much it mattered to their success and how they set up their practices. AMAP was mentioned here, Arctic Monitoring and Assessment Program, and I will just um, repeat this for one more thing, because it was actually very interesting that for a very long time, so that you know how kind of how much more open, so to say, thi things were, AMAP was even able to have its own observers to the working groups, as other working groups. Such was kind of the the flexibility that time. But there was also one other aspect to AMAP that I think every plan plenty of people would agree was important to AMAP's success, and that was support to the Secretariat. Um, so it would have capacity to work on the first groundbreaking report, and that continued delivering this ever since. We see it with all the working groups. Once you start giving support to the Secretariat, kind of, it, it really ups the, um, the game here. But, it's, but that's one thing. Of course, things started changing, and of course, a lot of change uh, um, has been actually started during the first Norwegian chairship of, of the Arctic Council. Um, and um, of course, no one um, defined it better than then Foreign Minister Sture, today's um, Prime Minister of, of Norway. So this is when things started changing. But also over next, so to say, well, eight, nine years, we've been seeing change in the council, that the council that used to operate really well below the radar, but also working groups were given a lot of space for, for their work. We've seen the trend to actually streamline this work. And you can say those are nitty gritty of the Arctic Council operations, but uh, plenty of the documents streamlining work of the Arctic Council came up during the second US chairship of, of the Arctic Council around 2015, 2017. So we would have, um, observer manual that actually said a lot of, um, that actually, well, to a large part, um, set guidelines for how working groups would um, interact with observers. We had outreach guidelines. We also had guidelines on collaboration with external bodies to the Arctic Council. Kind of everything to bring the council more in line. And it is, it is understandable at that time, because that was also the time when we already had all ministers of foreign affairs of eight Arctic states meeting together. Again, another thing that was completely inconceivable when the council was created. Um, that being said, it was already uh, the end of Finnish chairmanship and the ministerial meeting of Rovaniemi that we've seen that things might not go um, so well. At the time, it was a very different um, country that actually, through the challenge um, to the Arctic Council <laughs> on, the, on the issue that seemed no-brainer to everyone, which is climate change in the, in the Arctic Council, challenging the most basic scientific notion, really, that no one else thought would be debatable. But that was the first one. Of course, today we find the Arctic Council, as all the speakers said, in a, in a very different in a very different condition. And again, I can only um, reiterate what was said before and definitely credit Norway for great efforts um, since the start of its chairship to try to restart the working groups. 
through trying um, very different procedures so we could start this important, so we could see this important work moving forward. Um, in my concluding words, um, perhaps, um, since I'm not a laureate of the Moon Prize, um, I want there to say that Ministries of Foreign Affairs will, um, I won't suggest that they should step back. Um, I think that's, um, yeah, I'm not the person to do that. That being said, um, I think there is really um, something to, as we are moving forward, and hopefully we'll see the Arctic Council surviving this crisis, but, hope, but also to make it more resilient toward all future challenges that for sure will be coming our way from probably most unexpected corners. Um, I think my, my point would be really going once again to science policy um, interface in, in the Arctic Council. Today we actually heard from Prime Minister Stora that of course the main, the principle, the most basic task of every government is to provide security to its people. And I think many of us here, maybe everyone, will agree that knowledge-based decision-making, then science about what's happening, identifying emerging issues, are actually essential to providing this, this security. And I think moving forward is, um, and I'll use here um, words from Edward Alexander from Britain Council International, who once I think he captured it best. He said that for, for him, for, GC, for GCI, the Arctic Council is not the outcome, it's the process. And I think if we can challenge ourselves with a daring vision that perhaps um, maybe ministries of foreign affairs um, as they actually, um, to some extent, do at this point, engage very much in the, in the dialogue with analysts, with, with scientists, to understand things better. Um, so that perhaps the Arctic Council that, um, that we see, that we'll be having in the future, will be once more a more agile, a more adaptive structure, I think that might be serving our future and Arctic governance more in time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we are now going to reorganize a little bit here uh, with the tables so that we can have the, the uh, speakers uh, at two tables and then they can ask questions to themselves but then <laughs> or to among them as a group and then we open for, for the uh, audience here. So just wait a few minutes and, and we are ready I think. So I just invite the speakers to come up. Yep. Um, thanks again for very good introductions. Um, Any one of you that want to comment on one of the others on the stage? Could start. Uh, I think this both Oren and Gosia uh, say something very um, interesting, and that is this depolitization of of the Arctic Council and trying to see, and well, the most of the work of the IT Council is done in the working groups. And just going back one step down the ladder and bring that work for, uh, forward and trying to depoliticize the whole, um, the IT Council as such and seeing it as a process, I think that's, uh, I think that's uh, a great insight. And my impression is really that the Ministry of Foreign Affairs you're doing that, aren't you? So that's kind of a question to you because you're trying to give some leeway to the working groups, trying to tell them, well, try to figure out what to do in the situation we're in now. So, so like, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think I can talk without, yeah. They have given me, because I've broken my arm, <laughs> they can say, <laughs> I think <laughs> I cannot hold a microphone. <laughs> 
Um, Depoliticize, yes. I think that the work of the working groups have never been politicized, mm. and it is not now politicized either. But of course, the situation as it is today, with seven of the countries finding it difficult to cooperate with the eight country, makes it political, even, it is even if it is not political, the work in the, in the working groups. So the problem is our, our challenge is to find ways how we can make the working groups with members of the eight countries mm. to work together um, in a way that is acceptable for all the eight countries. And this is our challenge and we are really using all our creativity, <laughs> all our fantasy, we are discussing it with all the uh, countries and with all the working groups. We had a meeting with the working groups today discussing this. And of course, we know that they are in a very difficult situation because one country can do that, another country cannot do that. And this is the problem. But all the countries, all the eight countries agree that we must keep the Arctic Council as the preeminent forum for, uh, for Arctic discussions and handling of the Arctic. So yeah. That was not an answer. No, was it was a answer. very good <laughs> a bureaucratic whoa, whoa, answer, whoa, whoa, wasn't it? Yeah, well, was good. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you were sorry, but there's actually been quite a lot of variation among the working groups. So we often kind of generalize working groups. But if you if you dig if you delve down into the history of the different working groups, there's a good deal of individual character to them, and it might be very worthwhile to look more carefully at the experiences that they've had to see whether there are some insights that might come up from comparing and contrasting. Short, uh, whoops, <laughs> microphone. Um, I just wanted to ask a question related to uh, Professor Young, your comments about the difficulties of either elevating the Arctic Council or perhaps looking at some sort of either treaty or legal based. Uh, you had said, and I agree, that such uh, methods would be very difficult. But I guess the question I would ask, and this is an open question, in light of the concerns of the observer governments that the current situation with the Arctic Council is going to be make, make them much more difficult to maneuver, what kind of suggestions do you have about potentially addressing the concerns of the observer, the non-Arctic states who would like a greater say in the region? <coughs> of course, a big question. Um, but, but I think that in sort of practical terms, the way forward is to kind of minimize the formalities of the rules of procedure, to say, look, we've got work to do. A variety of actors can contribute to moving forward with respect to the work that we have to do. Let's not worry too much about labels. Who's an observer? Who's this? Who's that? Permanent participant, member, observer, whatever. And after all, the observers, you were talking about the observer states, but there are 39 observers. Uh, they include non-state actors. They include intergovernmental actors. I think when it comes to the convening power, you bring all these players together in a common space, and it don't make a big deal out of who's got what label, who's got what sort of tag or what color. Say, Let's just sit together and see whether or not there are ways forward, whether we can collectively come up with some, even in these times, which is tough, whether we can come up with some clever ideas, wherever they came from. But we might, act, might actually catch on and say, oh, that actually might get us somewhere. Could I just shortly add something on that? Because I think that's an opportunity we have to a larger degree now than maybe before. This is an it might be an opening for exactly that because what we see is among the seven, well, 
the seven Arctic states, is that they want to include the observers more than they did, uh, well, 10 years ago, clearly. So it could be a turning point on exactly what you're saying there, Oren, I think. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. That the, what I call a convening power is much greater today than it was in, let's say, the year 2000 or 20, 20 years ago. I mean, it creates certain practical problems. When you, when you have a meeting of the Arctic Council, and okay, we haven't had one since the crisis, but in recent past, when you have a meeting of the Arctic Council, it, it, there's so many people involved. <laughs> there's a limitation of where you can meet. But it actually has uh, grown, evolved substantially in terms of having a very wide range of players and interests and ideas sort of present in a setting in which they're, because of the relative informality, you can actually sit down and talk. So I think that has been a, I mean, okay, we now have the current crisis, but that has been a significant growth. I think, I think that uh, the war in Ukraine has not changed the situation for the observers. I think that the council has for a long time been open to observers and we really uh, acknowledge the fantastic contributions from the different observers and other countries in when it comes to uh, research in the Arctic and assisting in, in different, uh, in different uh, areas of cooperation. But um, I'm not sure if I understand um, what you mean by um, what kind of discussions you are thinking we should open up for that are not there, I don't know. Uh, of course, uh, the Arctic Council is an organization and um, all kinds of research are legal, yeah? also in the Arctic. But of course, to become an Arctic Council uh, defined project or research, you have to go through the Arctic Council. That's kind of normal for any organization, I think. But, but the Arctic Council as such wouldn't, would be open and happy for all research going on in the Arctic or elsewhere. Oops. Um. Yes, you can hear me. Um, well, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm, if I'm the right person to say to, I think there is, um, if there is maybe, uh, I can only present my understanding uh, of this, that perhaps in the, in the situation that we find ourselves with, and I know it's kind of popular, impopular way to say it, that, well, to think about things as, um, well, let us not go good crisis to, to waste in, in this. Maybe it, it is really the time for moving beyond exactly very formal way of structuring meetings and, and inviting people to dialogue. But it's, as I said, it, it's not the point that I wanted to make. I actually wanted to make another um, call to the Arctic Council at, at, the, at this point. And I feel, um, I would like to stress this point that I'm um, a huge fan <laughs> of, of the Arctic Council. Um, so it is absolutely, so what I'm going to say is really coming from, from this place, really thinking about, well, how can we, see the council going strong throughout this time. And this would be actually my call, if possible, and I do think that there is some work to be done in this area. It is actually call for greater transparency at this time. Um, because I think one thing that is missing, and I, by transparency, I don't, I don't squarely mean only formal communication, because a lot of effort has been done to, to have it in place. But I think one thing that has been missing is sort of, I mean, one thing, of course, was the first period right after the invasion, when or were sort of most observers really didn't know what was uh, happening. They were, well, the most regular channels of communication were, were broken. But I think even, even now, it's kind of for um, many of us who've kind of been <laughs> Uh, close to the Arctic Council, even if no, not part of the Arctic Council itself. Um, it is at times um, now difficult to actually to keep, um, I don't want to say keep track of things, but just to know what is happening in the, in the Arctic Council. And I think um, this, this one thing, bringing more transparency to, to what is um, happening now, not only in terms of communicating results of work that is now approved and, and so on, but actually, um, 
really just bringing up more, more openness, could serve the Arctic Council also in terms of, once again, reconfirming its place. Um, because otherwise, uh, someone might have a feeling that maybe there is not so much happening in, in the Council. Thank you. Is it working? Yes. Uh, we had many comments like that from observers, different observers, and we agree. Of course, we understand. Especially the first year was very difficult, very little information, and the observers used to uh, participate in the meetings, in the formal meetings, and there they got all the informations, information. And now we didn't have any meetings, so where should they have the information? But the other, the, the challenge for the Norwegian chairship was and has been, and maybe still is, that we are in a process. So you don't know, but we don't know either. <laughs> we are, we are uh, working together with the other members, with the indigenous peoples. We are discussing how can we do this. And we haven't reached uh, the goal yet. So, so we are, but we are open for, open for, and we have also started to have more meetings with the observers. We had one today, actually. Morten had one today, this morning. And we uh, met them also in September. And we have said to all observers that they can call us any time if they have questions. So uh, we understand that there is a need of information. Mm. But we also uh, ask for understanding that mm. we, are s we are really working mm. to, to come somewhere. And we, are, we haven't reached the goal yet. <laughs> Just to add to that, and um, well, I'm totally in line with what you're saying. Uh, there are eight Arctic states, and they have to agree, everyone. And that's complicated in itself, really. So it's a balancing act. So it's tough. I, I, I do understand. Mm. Thank you. I'll just say very briefly, um, noting your point about labels and whether labels are being overthought. Uh, certainly, we're seeing among some observer states, and I go back to the China example, that status in the Arctic is starting to become very important in the area of regional governance, that there is quite a bit of debate, uh, especially among the Asia observers, about are we Arctic stakeholders, in what way, and how should we be seen as such? So this is one of the complications that I think is going to become more pronounced under the current situation. Thanks. One thing that's very important to notice is that Many of the problems or issues or concerns that manifest in the Arctic are consequences of the behavior of people outside the Arctic, whether it's pops or heavy metals or plastics or climate. So in order to address effectively issues that are of great importance to human life in the Arctic, you need to find ways to provide outsiders with some sense of engagement. And actually, people often talk about they want to be stakeholders. What's really needed is to find ways to convince them that they have responsibility. So what they do is going to play an enormous role in sort of the quality of both the biophysical and the human environment of the Arctic. So we need to get to engage them. Whether or not you call them members, that's not the issue. The quite the issue is to that they acquire a sense of responsibility and obligation. Okay. Um, thank you to the panel so far. Is it okay that I open up for the public? You are ready? <laughs> Good. I, 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 I <laughs> ask him. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Sure. Yeah, Leif Lundsman, Nordic Journalist Center, Denmark. Um, in search of opportunities to continue cooperation despite conflicts and crises. Perhaps there's, a, there's one place to look for best practices. Uh, recently, I participated in, uh, in the International Aeronautical Conference in Azerbaijan. 
uh, along with scientists from the US, from Russia, from India, from Israel, from Iran, South Africa, Saudi Arabia, or Europe, across borders, across conflicts. And they have somehow achieved in getting a status of exemptionism when it comes to science and science, uh, space science. And at this very moment while speaking, 400 kilometers above us is the International Space Station uh, containing for the time being, a Dane, one of my country fellows, an American, two Russians, a Japanese and an Italian. Uh, and they've been asked how they can continue cooperating despite times of conflict and crisis. And they say, in space, we are colleagues. We don't carry nationalities. Wouldn't it be possible, inspired by the international aeronautical or astronautical community, uh, to have or obtain an Arctic exemptionism to conflicts? when it comes to space, uh, to science at least. Thanks. Yeah, yeah it's Guru Holm from the Norwegian Broadcasting. Um, the Russian, I'm a correspondent in Moscow at the moment, <laughs> I need to say that. So uh, the Russian uh, Arctic strategy with this addition from uh, February last year, uh, it says clearly that they see international climate work as, a, as an attempt to limit the sovereignty of the state and its freedom to use its own natural resources. So this is a statement, of course, but to what extent, you who work with Arctic, to what extent is that felt, that it has changed the attitude? Is, or do you feel it, that really this paranoid way of looking to the, at the West, which is runs through the whole Russian political um, elite. Uh, is it also felt in practice, or is it just a statement? Yes. Can answer. Uh, we, uh, as the chair of the Idiaki Council, we have, we have discussions with all, all the other members, also with Russia. So we, we have, uh, we have uh, discussions with our Russian colleague uh, regularly. And, our, uh, and this has, of course, been expected from many, that uh -huh, now Russia will start to sabotage the work of the council, they will use it in their, in their propaganda and so on. But so far, they have not done that. They have been very constructive in the Arctic, as they has always be, have always been very constructive in the Arctic cooperation. And I think that Russia wants to uh, stay a member of the Arctic Council, and, and that's why they also show, as it is uh, now, a cooperative modus, yeah. Maybe a, com or maybe a comment on the space question. Uh, it's, a good, it's a good comment. The, the trick in the Arctic is that you have to find ways to facilitate and encourage cooperation between, at, at one and the same time, between a group of actors who have actual jurisdiction and a group of other actors who have interests and maybe obligations, but not jurisdiction. Whereas in space, it's beyond national jurisdiction. So everyone, in a sense, is in the same boat or in the same spaceship. <laughs> that's, that's not to say you can't find ways to have two different kinds of animals cooperating on issues of common concern, but there's still somewhat different kinds of animals. And so that's, a that's an extra dimension to the challenge that doesn't arise in the space context. Thank you. Uh, my name is Martin. I'm representing the Regional Office for Europe of the World Health Organization. Um, the reason I'm here is because we are deeply concerned about the health status of the population in the uh, circumpolar region, in particular the indigenous populations. Um, more than 50% of the adult population in Greenland smokes. Uh, the suicide rate amongst uh, 
Greenlandic youth is amongst the highest in the world. And this is not a phenomenon that's unique to the Inuit in Greenland. My point is that we cannot afford not to collaborate in the Arctic. Climate change is going to exacerbate the issue, so we have to find a way. In the European region, we have uh, 53 member states, including both Ukraine uh, and Russia, Azerbaijan and Armenia, Israel. Yet, we continue to work. It's not without its complications, but we do continue to work. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Any answer? Yeah. Uh, yes, we know this. And this is mental health is one of the things that we would like to put also up on the list of priorities. A very important topic to work with, and it has been a priority also for other chairships. Um, and we agree with you. We agree with you that there are so many important topics in the Arctic that we cannot stop cooperating. So this is the Norwegian view. That's why we want to keep the Arctic Council alive. We want to cooperate on mental health, on climate change, on biodiversity, on search and rescue, emergency preparedness in the sea. Uh, we want to cooperate to make better societies for our people in the Arctic. And we think that the Arctic countries, all of the eight, have something to learn from each other in this respect. If I could just add to, to this one point, to, to Norwegian efforts, and, and I think, well, I hope that for my call for more transparency, it was not coming across that I'm actually, um, I am a big supporter of Norway's approach to, to many things. And to this, of course, so much of our focus is on the Arctic Council. But I think ju just to point out that also Norwegian actions, I mean, we, we haven't mentioned yet here, but for instance, Arctic Mayors Forum, are there bodies that are actually playing hugely important role and they also benefit a lot from Norwegian support in, in this regard and actually, well, um, health and mental well-being are one of the top issues that, that are being now d discussed there. So I think, yes, just to, just to echo this, that there is exactly Norwegian position in the Arctic Council po points to that, but it also goes through, through other bodies, not only this one. Yes, I understand, Madame, would you say that the Russians with which you work, uh, Stéphane Dion, Special Envoy of Canada for in Europe, um, that uh, the, the people, uh, the Russians w uh, that you have as colleagues, they are very committed for the Arctic Council and, and the Arctic cause, but they will not decide. The one who will decide is that Putin may decide to pull out, to leave the Arctic Council. I don't know if you have any idea about the likelihood that this may happen, and maybe it's impossible to answer this question, but we need to try. If it's happening, if Russia leaves, uh, in some ways it may say that the seven like-minded uh, members are very good to work together. It will be easier for them to work. But they will lose uh, Russia, which is half of the Arctic. So if there are this kind of scenarios that are discussing between academics or uh, within the Arctic Council, what will happen if Russia leaves? Okay, I'll give it a try. <laughs> okay, I think the Arctic Council will die. Uh, but I think the working groups will still be alive kicking, so hopefully. So, but I think that will, because we have to acknowledge, as you say, half of Arctic is Russian. And uh, the Arctic Council is the product of the end of the Cold War. And the Arctic Council is all about circumpolar cooperation. So if if that happens, maybe not die, that's maybe a hard word, but then it's, you used uh, a better word, Oren, it's just something that will well, disappear. Because in, in, they like get better. Right Organizations don't die, they just become dead letters. Dead letters, that <laughs> was the word. So They're still listed on you know, yes. papers, mm. lists on paper. But yeah, or it becomes something else, like yeah. the Barons Corporation, yeah. that has become a Nordic corporation. Uh, now, without Russia, uh, I, I believe that it would be a great loss to lose half of the, the Arctic in the Arctic Council. And I think also that it will be difficult to reestablish if we lose them. So that's why we are working to keep all the eight. 
you know, I think the raison on that of the Arctic Council would would evaporate really if Russia were formally to leave. Um, the issues wouldn't go away, no. you know, the problems wouldn't go away, and so we would be still here saying, are there any things we can do to address the issues, even if this mechanism is no longer a vehicle which is, in terms of benefits and costs, worth struggling to keep alive in some way. But we still be, we still be engaged with the issues. Yeah, because uh, Arctic cooperation is not dead, but only the Arctic Council. So that's important. That's well, important to underline. That's important to underline. Mm. It, um, but I think that we have to think. We have to think long term. And now we have the war. Of course, now it seems we cannot see an end to this terrible situation mm. that we all, uh, which is horrible for all of us. But we have to think long term, and we want to keep the Arctic Council mm. for this reason. Just Quick points to add to that about the previous question about uh, health, very key. And we've heard quite a bit over the uh, last few days about the Arctic 8, the Arctic 7, the Arctic 5. It's also very important, and we've been reminded of this, to also think about the Arctic 4 million. Because if we're going to talk about security, we need to talk about security of the individual. And this is where I would normally go into an international relations lecture, but I won't, uh, <laughs> on human security. The second point about uh, what happens if Russia leaves the Arctic Council, I think this definitely needs to be uh, looked at very carefully because Russia had, the Russian government, I should say, has hinted at this to say that, okay, we have other options, we have other friends and allies that we can certainly go to. And this is what I meant before about constellations, that we might be seeing different groups of Arctic cooperation which don't represent the Arctic as a whole. And I think this would be very unfortunate because, unfortunately, a lot of the issues that we're dealing with, including the environment, including human security, require a whole of Arctic approach. Okay, more, yeah, we have a hand here. Thanks very much. Uh, Jim Gamble, Pacific Environment. Um, I've been very fortunate in my career to have had the opportunity to work in the Arctic Council with a permanent participant organization, with an observer organization, and also at the IMO. And um, something that I've observed um, is the interesting relationship between influence and power amongst the, the three bodies. Um, for observers, uh, it's exactly opposite to member states. So in other words, observers have no power at the ministerial level. I, in fact, I, uh, as an observer, I wouldn't go to a ministerial meeting. There's just not an opportunity to do very much there. A little bit more at senior Arctic officials meetings. I think it is useful to attend them. More at uh, working group meetings and the most at the project level. When you're sitting around the project table, nobody cares. If you've got expertise or resources, um, you can play a very significant role in any project. So I completely agree with Oren. I think he was hinting at this uh, making things a bit more informal and taking advantage of the fact that observers can still work in a way that Arctic states can't. I think we could, we could try to, to, uh, to uh, augment that, to make it easier to happen, and, and maybe make a lot of progress in that way. It's similar with the permanent participants, but they also suffer from the political realities as well. And I know it's, it's difficult for the, for the six organizations because there is kind of an outsider now. And then I'll also say this, just as an observation, at the IMO, Russia still is involved, still sits at the table, still attends the meetings, um, but my observation is this, that they have lost moral authority. And they recently uh, were not reelected to the IMO Council, and I think this is kind of direct evidence of that. So um, I think it's a tricky and uh, potentially dangerous thing to assume that in other bodies the cooperation can continue, but because maybe it can, but I don't think it'll be the same, and that might lead, uh, lead us down a path that takes us somewhere we don't want to go. One comment, uh, Jim, on, on that is that <clears throat> I've been arguing 
very much along the same lines that you have of kind of downplaying the sort of formality and emphasizing the informality and getting the work done, you know, at the working group and especially I agree project level. I, I, I do think that the kind of formality of status uh, is important when it comes to the permanent participants. Because that is, in some sense, what they have as a sort of distinctive um, identity in this sort of context. And, I, and I, I think that is a very important um, reality to acknowledge. And it's certainly, and I certainly do not want to be uh, understood as, in some sense, belittling or, or dismissing that kind of the significance for them of that kind of um, legitimacy, shall we say? But in, in every other respect, I think exactly what uh, Jim has said is, is is very much on point. A small, a small comment on that. Uh, actually, we have kept a format of the indigenous peoples. So we have met them already two, three times. We, the last meeting was on Monday uh, with all, all the six uh, indigenous uh, peoples organizations uh, from all the region participating together with the chair, discussing all the, all the topics of the Arctic Council today. And of course, not agreeing on everything, but really exchanging views. And uh, so I think for the indigenous peoples, it will be a great loss if we lose the Arctic Council. Yeah. Thank you very much for the opportunity. My name is Ji Hun Jung, and I am with the Korea Power Research Institute. And uh, it is an honor to uh, be able to uh, ask a question to a great panel and a timely panel. Um, from uh, an observer perspective, it is, it is fair to uh, uh, acknowledge that what, what uh, has been remarkably done by the uh, Norwegian chairship uh, during its uh, first half, because, because uh, Norway came up with a very innovative solution that enabled uh, the smooth uh, transition of the chairship from the Russian and Norway, and also uh, 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 the, the update uh, rules of procedures also enabled the uh, um, continuous uh, decision maker within the uh, uh, Arctic Council working groups in, in a form of the written methods. Uh, my question uh, in turn would be what kind of the additional achievement do you uh, uh, expect for the uh, second half of the uh, Norwegian chairship? And uh, given, given the presence of uh, Saur Rosevo here, um, uh, how your uh, Russian expertise would be contributing to the process uh, for the uh, goals of the Norwegian chairship. Thank you. Uh, my <laughs> Russian expertise, yeah. <laughs> I have been living in Moscow the last five years because I was working in the, in the Norwegian embassy in Moscow. That's what he is <laughs> referring to. Um, what we want, we want more activity. The Norwegian chairship wants more activity because we understand that for the Arctic Council to be relevant, not to be only a letter or a, like a headline, or I don't remember what you called it. Dead, dead letter. <laughs> dead letter, yeah. <laughs> dead letters. We n understand that we have to have uh, activity, we have to produce results, we have to, to have research uh, with the members, with the observers, with everybody, and we want this, and we are working to achieve it. And we also understand that the written procedure, which was a first step, it was as far as we could mm. come, mm. is not very efficient. Mm. Because, mm. of course, you cannot uh, discuss project in writing on uh, emails. Mm. You cannot, like, recreate a project that ha is not if good enough. You cannot, uh, yeah, it's very, it's very inefficient. So we want to come further, but we are in the process of coming to a more efficient working process. We don't know how it will end, but we are working also to have the working groups working more, having more projects. Yeah, so, yeah. 
Short one. Short one. Yeah. And then it's Denmark and then it's Sweden. So I guess cooperating and finding common ground among the Nordics should be a key component in the future survival of the Arctic Council. Yes and no, yeah? Because, and no. <laughs> <laughs> because we are the eight. So all eight, I see Canada standing there. <laughs> we are the eight. We have to, co to agree, all of us. But of course, we are discussing with the coming uh, chairships, Denmark and Sweden, continu what is it called in English? Continuity, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. yes, of our work, for it not to stop in 2025, in May, when we deliver uh, the chairship to next. Yeah. So, yes or no? <laughs> okay. um, thank you to all of you. Thank you to the panel. Give them a hand. <laughs> and thank you to you as an audience. This has been very interesting, uh, stimulating. Uh, I hope that I can see some of you uh, at uh, UIT tomorrow and continuing the discussion about, not only about the Arctic Council, but Arctic governance in general. So, thank you. Have a nice day. There is a lot of possibilities to discuss further in Trumsa. <laughs>